Hello everyone, uh, my name's Nick and I'm here at the MAA, the Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology and uh, we're looking at uh, one of the fantastic exhibitions they've got on at the moment. Here it is, another India uh, and I'm very lucky because I'm not just going to be going round the exhibition on my own but I've got Mark here with me who is the curator of the exhibition uh, and he's going to be uh, picking out a few of the objects and telling me uh, and telling you guys as well at home lots of interesting uh, things about them. Um, if you've got any questions then make sure you write them in the comments below because we'll be uh, taking your questions and directing them to, to Mark as well uh, and any comments you've got too throw them out there and we'll put them, put them to Mark and we'll, we'll discuss them. And, and please do like and share this too because we want as many people as possible to uh, watch this video and learn more about the exhibition. So, Mark, this exhibition is called Another India, but what do you mean by Another India first of all? What, what is that? Right, so Another India, um, Explorations and Expressions of Indigenous South Asia is the first exhibition that this museum has done uh, focusing on, on India and South Asia for almost three decades and actually one of, one of very few that the museum has done in its history. From my point of view, it was starting off showcase, showcasing and uh, giving an opportunity to explore the extraordinarily rich and diverse collections we have from India that have never really been engaged with yeah. in the museum's history. And what we wanted to do was to showcase a different kind of India, not the India that is most, most familiar to audiences in the UK, potentially even not the India that is, that is most familiar to people in India itself. This is the India of Indi India's indigenous Adivasi or tribal populations. Yeah. And uh, so a minority, minority communities incredibly diverse across the country almost 9% of the country's population. And 9% is a Sounds lot of Sounds like people, a small figure, it? doesn't yeah. it? Right. Um, yeah. So that's and like, what's that, like 100? It's about 100, 104 million. So yeah. that's getting wow. for double the population of the UK, just to give a sense of the scale and the diversity. So we think about this as kind of like a minority, well, we describe it as a minority of people, but actually it's a, a huge number of people. So, so the number of the different objects here must be incredibly diverse, the different cultures mm. that you're kind of showing, basically. Abs absolutely. I mean, we're, we're, we're drawing in the museum's collections, which are partial, are bitty, are eclectic, and, yeah. and, uh, and trying to generate a, generate a narrative from that. But it already engages with the histories, the cultures, the traditions of dozens of cultural groups. We are, you know, ethnically, culturally, linguistically diverse, yeah. and and that. Uh, so I suppose that's one of the main objectives of the show, to show that there is another India. There are other Indias from the one that we know. On one level, this is not about Bollywood curry and salaries, right? There's other stuff going yeah. on, and I think it's really important to start engaging that kind of thing. Fantastic. But well, what we're going to be looking at uh, in this film is some of the contemporary objects mm. that you've got, because you've got. Uh, a number of objects that have been uh, created especially for that exhibition. Yeah. That's right, isn't it? And we've got one here. here so we let's go. have a look at that. Hannah, yeah. do you want to come in and just show this, uh, uh, this object first of all? And uh, well, yeah, Mark, tell me, tell us about this. Okay, so the backstory is this. I mean, we, as I say, it started off as a historical exhibition. We wanted mm. to showcase some of the collections that are little understood and little known from India in the museum. But I was also very concerned that actually this is this could be a show that in get, that basically tells stories through the through the story through the words of the dead white guys you know the 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 the, the European men and women who collected the material and who wrote about it yeah. and loses the voice of the indigenous people who made used owned and ultimately gave up yeah. these things so we uh, were very lucky to get an award uh, a new collecting award from Art Fund to commission new works by indigenous and Adivasi artists from across India, from the communities that are sort of represented in the uh -huh. historic collections that respond directly to those historic collections to try to help us think through it, to help us interpret it, and to sort of challenge the stories of it. And this is, <coughs> so um, last, last Easter, we, uh, we traveled across India to five different communities holding workshops with local mm. artists and local, uh, local specialists to il introduce the exhibit, introduce the museum. This is Cambridge, this is the university, small town in East Anglia. This is the kind of collection we hold. 
These are the kind of stories that we are trying to tell at the moment. Here are images of some objects from your place, from your tradition, from this village. And then after, basically after the lunch break, I said, all right, guys, so what would you make now? So this object here is uh, by one of the people that you met yeah. when you were there, an, 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 an indigenous artist, Absolutely. is that right? Yes, yeah. so this is so by... So what's going on here? Yeah, tell, well, tell us a bit more. Well, quickly. I suppose, uh, in, in a sense, it's full of questions. It's by uh, contemporary artist Bupendra Bagel from uh -huh. the town of Kondagon in the state of Chhattisgarh in sort of central southern India. And is it made out of uh, <clears throat> brass, or it what's is. it made out of? Uh, Bupendra um, works in the, the style of sculpture and craft, uh, craft traditional to, the, to this area, called uh, Dhokra or Gadwakam oh. and it uses the lost wax technique for casting in um, in a sort of copper alloy uh -huh. usually described as bell metal. Often that actually uses different kinds of metal and of, 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 from different sources. Now they use quite a lot of scrap metal actually but it's an absolutely traditional style. Um, one of the, I suppose the most iconic form of tribal art right. if that's the term you want to engage with and and in a sense, it's inspired by a photograph that was taken in Bupendra's region in 1935. And there you go. You can see the photo there as well. And, and to me, this looks like, well, you've got like a very sort of classic colonial sort of figure. Um, and you've got an in, indigenous person there as well. And, well, they, they don't look like they're getting on particularly, basically. That's the sense that I'm getting from it. What, what is being depicted Well, it, you're right. It is uncomfortable. It's not an easy image. And it, yeah. it's, it, but it's also a bit ambiguous, right? It's, uh -huh. hard, it's hard to read. When I looked at the photograph, I found this photograph in the archive of the Centre of South Asian Studies here yeah. in Cambridge. And, and again, because I was researching the collector himself. And uh, it's captioned on the reverse, Edgar Hyde, for it is he showing a picture of Aboriginal girls to an Aboriginal girl, but she is too shy to look. Now, of course, shyness may be one of the things that's going on yeah. here, but to me, this was a perfect illustration of, you know, the, you know complete with pit helmet, this is colonial anthropology in action. This is the, the, the colonial state confronting a native woman with anthropology in the form of a book, mm -hmm. and there is discomfort here. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's the sort of the white colonial male gaze, and that's a gaze that she is resisting. So mm -hmm. it's a by... So it's resist <laughs> it could actually be resistance that... It, I, I, I think yeah. there... And, and in a sense, to me, it was the perfect... It was the perfect image for the exhibition, which yeah. is why it's our poster image. You know, it, it, it's sort of... It's not quite clear what's going on. This is, this is hard to read, and there's a relationship there which needs to be understood. Yeah. And hopefully we'll get to understand that in the next... Yeah, well, should we move on? And remember, if you've got any questions at all, uh, then post them below, and uh, we will answer them. I say we will answer them. I mean, the Mark will, will answer them, but I'll put them to. Uh, and uh, let's go right round. As we go round, you'll see there's loads of different uh, objects here, all fascinating stuff. You're going to have to come to the exhibition if you want to look at them, I'm afraid. We haven't got time to talk about all of them now. Because, Mark, you wanted to talk about this here, didn't yeah. you? So, um, well, what is it, first of all? What, what, what is it? Right. Yeah. <laughs> so this is, a, this, this is a, a wooden pillar uh, a wooden made, pillar? made out okay. of wood, of saja wood. Um, again, comes from, uh, is made by an artist uh, called, uh, named Pandi Ram Mandavi, who's a traditional artist uh, and wood carver. So again, it's a contemporary piece. That's it right, is, yeah. It? So, so, so what, what I'm going to try to do is throughout, throughout this chat to look at, look at, these are all pieces that were commissioned through the conversations that we had okay. with Support of Art Fund. And this is, this is a gond memorial pillar. So it's a pillar that was erected on the outskirts of villages in commemoration of a deceased ancestor. Oh, so basically, uh, when someone died, they'd, uh, they'd put this pillar out there and it'd kind of be celebrating, celebrating them, basically. Um, that, that absolutely. It? Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's, um, it, it, it's a memorial to, to, to a member of a family mm. that has passed away. It, uh, it depicts sort of general sort of scenes from daily life, but also, mm -hmm. um, uh, but also scenes from the life of that individual. Mm -hmm. And it was erected to be, to be a monument to them, but it was also erected on the outskirts of villages to offer protection to the living. This is about relationships between ancestors, relationships between the living and the dead. And it remains, therefore, an important part of, uh, so it's, of it's been of interest to anthropologists yeah. for a long time, but it's also significant for contemporary communities. You know, that this is, and, you know, and, and I suppose we can think quite a lot about what it's doing in a museum like this. 
Yeah, well, you tell me then, what, what is it doing in a museum like right. this? Why, why have we got this here? Why is it important to have um, objects like this? Well, I think it's probably easiest to let the artist say that. So yeah. I'll try to speak for him. So we held a workshop in, um, uh, it was actually Easter weekend 2016, so at the end of March, and we um, uh, involved artists and community members from the Santal and mm -hmm. Gond Adivasi communities. And so there are three artists from each, and Pandiram Mandavi, who's an artist from, uh, from uh, Pondagon, or from Naryanpur in, uh, in South India, saw this picture. Oh, let's have a look at showing. this photo here, yeah. And this is a photograph from the museum's collection of a Gond memorial pillar, an Urasgata, that was taken by a British artist called Margaret Millward, actually when she was travelling with Edgar Hyde, the gentleman that we met yes. in that previous sculpture in, in the 1930s. And Pandiran looked at this, so this is one of the images that I showed the participants in the, in, in the workshop, and he said, well, you know, this is obviously an important piece of, of, of our heritage, it, it, it works well as a sort of monument, as a memorial for us, and actually that whole question of how it offers protection, you know, wouldn't it be, you know, it, it's appropriate that that is the kind of thing that goes mm -hmm. into a museum, so, you know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow, fascinating. Uh, so there we go. Uh, this is. And when, when was this photo taken? Is this so the, that was. I'm gonna say February 1936. Oh, wow. so you can be very specific with <laughs> yeah. it. Uh, and uh, as you can see, we've got loads of different uh, depictions of life here. And you said these were uh, sort of general depictions of life, but also specific to the the person that had had died. Is that mm. right? So they might be sort of things that generally people would do, but actually they're also things that they particularly enjoyed or particularly that did a lot. That's sort of uh, absolutely. Yeah. So, so it works as a biography of an individual, but, mm. but also of, of, of a community generally. So you've got the harvest of, um, of fruits and flowers oh, yes. for, making, uh, uh, for making alcohol. Mm -hmm. You've got um, um, scenes, uh, scenes of worship, the, these flags, I think, are a sort of shrine that's erected in the outskirts of the village. Um, uh, different kinds of ritual, different dances, but also scenes of hunting, of, uh, yeah. you know, of, of, of working in the forest. And uh, so, to an extent, for, for, for members of this community, very, very much recognisably yeah. them. Yeah. And, and I think that's one of the important things in terms of, you know, the exhibition is called Explorations and Expressions of Indigenous yeah. South Asia. It's about how, uh, how um, anthropologists and collectors from, from Britain and Europe were, were, were investigating and trying to look for something, but yeah. it's also about how they and community then and now express a sense of themselves and what that is. So, oh, wow. and, and do people still uh, make these uh, today when someone died in, in this community? Less so. Less, less so. so. I mean, I, I think this is this is this is very much a heritage object. And yeah. It was one that we um, that in working working through the workshop. Actually, Pandiram suggested two things. Yeah. He suggested um, I could make you a pillar, yeah. or I could make you a swing. Oh, wow, that and would have been so, cool. Wouldn't it? Yeah. And so, uh, because uh, in front of temples and shrines are, are erected these large wooden frame mm -hmm. swings, and it's the swing on which the, uh, the badwa, the, uh, uh, the shaman of the village, reaches in a sort of ecstatic trance. Oh, right. And he says, so actually, as an icon of us, this, this is pretty, pretty important. But they're big. Yeah. And I said, you know, we've got 108 square meters of exhibition yeah. space. Maybe you could do the pillar, and he was happy with that, and it sort well, of worked. It's pretty impressive, and we've got another. Is this another sort of pillar? It it, it here, is or sort it, of pillar. What's yeah. going on here? So this is again by another Gond artist. This time a a, a young a young man named uh, Pokli Nageshwa Rao from um, uh, who had uh, recently completed his um, his uh, um, a degree in in fine art from from Hyderabad. And it's, uh, called, it's called Ocean of Blood. It's, it's called Ocean of oh, yeah. Blood. And it's, uh, this is another example of how we were sort of trying to you know, interact with each other and make it work. Yeah. Uh, Buckley showed me a picture of a sculpture that he had made for his degree show, which was uh, about three metres long and about yeah. a metre wide, all on the floor. And again, the same issues with Pandy Ram. I said, it's great. Could you make it a pillar? <laughs> um, and he looked at me like I was an idiot, but then ultimately <laughs> went for it. And I'm so glad he did. This yeah. is, this is a story. Um, Ocean of Blood is a reference to um, the uh, the Hindu the Hindu myth, the Hindu uh, story, um, the churning of the milk ocean, when the gods and the demons combine, join forces to churn uh, the ocean of milk uh, at the at the bottom of which lay Amrita, the nectar of immortality. Both the gods and the demons really wanted this. So there was a long uh, so. 
they joined forces, they took a uh, sacred mountain, turned it, on it, turned it on its tip, placed it on the shell of Vishnu, who had transformed into a turtle, wrapped the great snake around the, around the, the churning rod and basically pulled, so it's a tug of war. At the end of which the gods um, basically tricked the demons and made off with the Omrita. But actually what came out of the ocean was this nectar of immortality, uh -huh. but also everything that was good and bad in the world, so, and a great poison as well. So it's about, it's about poison, it's about, it's, it's, it's about struggle, it's about, it's about trickery, but it's also about what gets ground up in a tug uh -huh. of war. And Buckley is using that as a metaphor for telling the story of the Salwa Judum, which and what's was, that? the yeah. Salwa Judum was, um, a government counter, a state government counterinsurgency campaign against the uh, against Maoist rebels, the Naxalites, mm -hmm. who are living in. Uh, so is this relatively recently? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So this century, uh, yeah. uh, the, the last decade, and and uh, through this, the uh, something that is absolutely raw for communities today, particularly uh, um, uh, uh, the Gons and Gondi speakers. Mm -hmm. It's um, <coughs> basically what happened was. Um, in a decades-long struggle against it between the government and the, and the Maoist rebels, the, the, the government took the initiative of forming a, um, a militia of mm -hmm. young Adivasi men and um, sent them out poorly trained and poorly armed against the Maoists, and the inevitable happened. Thousands were killed. So this has become a horrifying, you know, a, a horrifying story yeah. and, and, and of immense political importance for, for the communities today. And, and Buckley is presenting this as it's made of scrap metal, it's gnarly, it's, there's, it's mostly bike parts, yeah. actually motorbike parts, so you've got motorcycle chains, bits of scrap metal, uh, bicycle luggage racks, lots of, uh, it's, it's, it's raw, it's difficult, it's, uh, you can see here the, so the, the, the government forces, uh, the military and the, the Maoists mm. tugging and the people yes. that get ground up in all of this are the Adivasis below. So we see a line of Adivasi dancers on the ground, yes. you know, and, and so, and this has become just an incredibly powerful piece. And for me, I suppose, this exhibition was always going to be something that tried to treat colonial history, but also post-colonial history, the, um, the, the sort of, that engages with the, with, with the cultures and artistic traditions of the communities we're looking at, but also the histories that they, so yeah, the, what, I, the hardships that they they've had to deal with. Yeah, what a fascinating piece of piece of work. So it's used a uh, the artist used a traditional uh, story, uh, but it uh, used it to illustrate a sort of contemporary um, uh, thing that happened. Yeah, it's Absolutely. really fascinating. And, and as a pillar, I yeah. think it works very interestingly yeah. with this. You know, you've got two monuments that tell very different kinds yeah. of things, about, which one wouldn't expect. Uh, Anthropology Museum or no, a, a no. historical anthropology collection to be able to tell. And well, so, well, I tell you what, shall we move on to the next object? Yeah. I want to make sure we see everything. Uh, remember that uh, you need to come to the exhibition to see all the objects, everything here. Again, we're going to pass lots of interesting stuff. I tell you what, Hannah, give a little sneak preview for when people uh, actually arrive um, because we want to have a look at this. Don't oh, hello there, we've got some uh, people in the museum, that's very good, for free to wander around, don't mind us. Um, but we're going have, well, to have a look at this uh, object just here, aren't we? Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. so what is this? It's, uh, it's a, a puppet sort of it's, show it's, of some it's, sort? It's, it's, it's a puppet show, and let me get run this way. Yes, I'll come as well. This, Sorry, this, is, this, is a chada, this is a Chada Badar. It's uh -huh. um, uh, the, a kind of puppet show that was, uh, that was made and performed traditionally in Santal areas, where, so the Santal community, one of the Adivasi communities in the east of India, um, again, a, a, a large community, vibrant, um, with, as, with, as with many of the, the, all the groups that we're talking about, an extraordinarily complex history. Um, they, uh, the Chada Badr was toured, was um, used by itinerant musicians and performers and performed in, in different villages. And so far as I know, this is the first puppet show or interactive that has been commissioned with art fund support wow. so thank you and I'll just give a little bit of the performance oh there we go wow so and this would this would be normally accompanied by um, uh, by musicians drummers you could see here yeah. dancers and and, and song uh, and, and music and um, it was proposed to us by um, 
uh, a Santal artist named Sean Mormo uh, at the same workshop that the other, that the other artworks emerge from. And he wanted to tell the story of how the Santals learned to dance. Dance mm -hmm. and performance and song is very, a very important aspect mm -hmm. of, the, of the sort of intangible heritage of, 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 of communities like this. And, and I have to say <laughs> that when he, first when he first proposed that, I, I was a bit troubled. Yeah, because we've got a lot of because uh, this all these objects here are from the the same area, right? Yeah. And they're quite militaristic. Yeah. Everything else here. And, and so, my, so why were you troubled? In, a, in aspects yeah. of it. So this was my starting point. Um, mm. uh, this is um, a drawing from the Illustrated London News in February 1856, and it was part of an account by uh, an, uh, a British uh, colonial officer and writer, uh, Walter Sherwell, telling the story of the 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 military suppression of the Santal Rebellion, the Santal Ho. Uh -huh. And I should take this opportunity to uh, say that this today actually marks the 152nd anniversary of the Santal Ho, the Santal oh, wow. Rebellion, so it's, uh, which has become an incredibly important day mm -hmm. for Santals and other Alabasi communities in, 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 in the region. To me, I looked at this image and it was it was extraordinarily weird. It's present. It's called Santal Trophy. It's presented as a sort of, um, as uh, it kind of looks like the sort of medallions that you've seen in in, yeah. in, in palaces like Versailles or something. It was, it was really really odd. And these are all objects that were confiscated from, looted from the defeated Santal rebels. And what interested me was that it kind of, they sort of map on to the objects that we yeah. have in the museum's history. And I thought in the museum's collection, I wanted to tell a story that was about, um, that was about colonial violence, about, about protest and resistance, and about how these things are presented as weapons, although interestingly, probably most of them aren't weapons. Okay. Um, so, you know, uh, axes, arrows would be used in hunting and life as much as anything else. It's, it, so, so, so you wanted, you wanted this, uh, uh, but the, the artist wanted to, to show you uh, Dance and the the, the culture yeah and the yeah so, so you can see so what happened right there what, yeah well I, I, did you argue it out a yeah, little, little bit a little bit yeah. I mean there, there was a sort of conversation that was mediated by uh, by a few people so, uh, Ruby Hembron that we worked with very closely a Santal uh, um, writer and publisher um, that that helped coordinate this process with us um, we we had a long conversation yeah and I said you know, honestly focusing on you know telling something that's about dance yeah felt kind of felt difficult for me because in a sense the sort of stereotype of tribal and Aldabasi peoples is in a sense sort of simple people who love to dance and sing and, and you know at every at every cultural political event the opening of a of a new mine or a new factory on Santal land there will be you know a troop of dancers will be brought out to perform and I thought is that the story that we're going to tell yeah, of course it's important yeah yeah um, and so but in the end actually Ruby uh, showed me a book that sort of <laughs> that helped that helped me help me reconcile it. So it's uh, a, a few a few months before um, the uh, Santal author called Hansdra Subendra Shekhar had written a book called uh, The Adivasi Will Not Dance, and it's a collection of short stories. The title of the sh the title story of which The Adivasi Will Not Dance. Um, and is that it? Op is that it up open, here? Opens with oh, uh, right, I see. and these are some lines from that, and it's uh, it, it's. Uh, it's an elderly, um, or an elderly Santal musician and, and performer who is invited by uh, invited to the opening of, of a new industrial complex on Santal land to perform in front of the president, and he brings his troop along and stands in front of the president and refuses to dance, and he said, "We are the will not dance anymore. We are like toys. Someone presses our on button or turns a key in our backsides." And we Santals start beating rhythms on our tamak and tumdak, our drums, or blowing tunes on our tirio or flutes, while someone is snatching away our very dancing groins. And that moment was, oh yeah, I know, yeah. I see how it all fits together. So in a really important way, you know, we start off with a very, I start off with a very clear idea of what yeah. the exhibition is going to be, and as that sort of poked at by by our by the people that we were working with and my curatorial fantasies crumbled perhaps around <laughs> my feet. Suddenly something new comes around. So this it becomes, you know, this is the kind of story that I could never have told mm. a year ago. 
So actually, one of the lovely things about uh, this exhibition is that it's, it's very much uh, led uh, by the, the artists that uh, created um, some of the some of the work for you. There's a Quite, strong yeah. sort of lead by them, which yeah, it Absolutely. seems really important yeah. to. And, and I wasn't always comfortable with that. You know, the, yeah, with but, there, yeah. there there were disagreements. Yeah, uh, but you know, it is kind of. And, but it's it's sort of give and take, you know. I mean, you know, right. people talk about collaboration with communities and museums all the time, and, and and it's difficult, but I mean, it's it's so rewarding, and you know, it's a, well, it's created yeah. some fantastic pieces, hasn't it? I mean, I think that's that's excellent, isn't it? Um, should we should we move on? Would you like yeah. to uh, see something else? Uh, remember, if you've got any questions or comments, stick them below, and uh, I'll put them to Mark. But um, yeah, let's have a look. It was this that you uh, wanted to uh, yeah talk to us about. Well, what is it? What is it? Um, what it is, is a pillar. It's a house post. Right. It's, um, uh, so we visited um, a village called Chenwethu, mm -hmm. which is um, in the state of Nagaland, home to, the, uh, to a very diverse um, group of, of related communities uh, known as the Nagas. And this is actually from a Konyak Naga, K-O-N-Y-A-K, not right, okay. yeah, uh, yeah. Naga community in um, uh, in Nagaland, from uh, up by the the border with Myanmar, and, and it's got all these different sort of well, sections to it. Do they represent different things, or mean different things, they, or are they just patterns, or what's they, going they, on? They do yeah. actually. The um, it was described to me when I was there that so this represents the ba fruit that uh, that grows wild in the forest, and it's uh -huh. uh, it's a famine food. It's you know, this is this represents our resilience in times of struggle, right. you know, in times of hardship. Um, this this actually is the banana fruit, or the, uh, the banana uh, so which, or the banana flower, which again is a famine food, something like that. Um, this uh, sort of hourglass shaped figure oh, is yeah. um, is a lot wa. It's uh, um, uh, an armlet made out of elephant ivory, elephant tusk, and it was worn by high status men. Uh, uh -huh. So that's a sign of status, that's a sign of this. Yeah. And, and this was described for me as, um, I mean, it's this sort of crosshatch. This mm -hmm. is what they, uh, what's described to me as the totin tit. It's, um, it's a mark that is made in the bark of a tree trunk, mm -hmm. of a tree that's growing, you know, growing in the forest on, on sort of common land. And someone, a man or a woman will make, make a mark on this and say, to basically say, like, I've, I've marked this. This is, uh, right. this is mine. I have a use of this. So, in a sense, it's status, authority, resilience, resistance in times of struggle. Step off. This is mine. And yeah. and actually, this came from. Uh, this was inspired by uh, uh, the house of Cheno Kuzutropa of Hoya, a, a, a gentleman that we visited um, in April last year, uh, and his. Uh, lives in an extraordinary traditional house in, mm -hmm. in, in the village and is uh, uh, and the previous autumn mm -hmm. had actually commissioned a new set of pillars to basically hold up his roof wow. running around the veranda. Is that, is that him just... The, this, should we have a look at this? Here, so we've got here. a photo here. I presume is that, is that him just, just here? Is here, that right? here, is, uh, here's, here's the gentleman himself sta um, sitting, actually supervising the construction of, oh. uh, of, of this pillar with one of the sort of inspiration, uh, the, the pillars that inspired it beside it. And um, yeah, it's, <coughs> it, it's, it's extraordinary. One thing that um, we, we started off having a long conversation mm. about, about this and I was fascinated by, by how it would work. One of the things that we did say about the sculptures was, can everything be about 50, no more than 50 centimeters wide by about three meters high? Because we want to make sure we can get it through the yeah. door. And so, you know, the sort of pillar thing, as we've seen elsewhere, works kind of well, yeah, yeah. especially for a small gallery like this, but it was also engaging with the traditional thing. And actually what happened was that it was after a workshop involving different artists and different, uh, uh, different members of the local community uh, that we actually ended up collaboratively designing a new pillar. Uh, so generally they would have about three or four different designs on it. This has 10 starts off at the very top. I'm not sure if we can get up that one. <laughs> but this is um, uh, sort of a mitun head. Uh, What's an, that? What's uh, that so a mitun is uh, very much like a, a, a buffalo it's a, a, okay. a, 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 that is sort of semi-domesticated. Uh, semi um, 
Uh, below that is the, um, and the sorry, the mid one is actually it, 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 it is the animal that appears on the state flag of Nagaland, so it's an important um, identity. Below that is a sort of uh, traditional representation, uh, you know, an abstracted form of the head of the hornbill. Uh -huh. The hornbill being um, one of the uh, being a very very important cultural symbol for the Nagas. Uh, below that, two panels of headhunting tattoos. So above. Uh, what do you mean by headhunting? So the Nagas were, um, are famously and controversially, I guess, um, they have traditionally many were um, uh, were in terms of village village conflict mm -hmm. uh, conflict between communities. Um, uh, the um, head taking was a very important part of conflict. So um, so. Um, and of course, this was an aspect of Naga identity that was at the same time shocking but fascinating yeah. for Victorian and later British yeah. anthropologists. And you can imagine, well, we know the kind of stereotypes that come up from that. Um, but there were stories about um, this, obviously, that this is the kind of representation of communities like this that is very, you know, these are, you know, I mean, on one level, it's, it's basically primitive savages, which we don't. Which is you know thoroughly inappropriate way of talking about people now, um, but there were a lot of anthropologists, many of whom were um, were colonial officers, who made a point of explaining and trying to understand the mm -hmm. practice. So it was about it was about fertility. It was about uh, uh, there was a spiritual aspect to to the taking and and, and the preservation of preservation of heads, but actually it was also very much about status, yeah. uh, male and female status. So the the sort of inverted V, or the, the V shape up there, sort of horns, that's uh, again a stylized version of the horns that cognac men would have worn as a tattoo on their on their chest. This tattoo underneath is actually a, a navel tattoo that would have been worn on the belly button. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, it's a woman's tattoo. So what we tried to do was to take elements of, uh, and these were suggested by our cognac, our cognac friends, uh, elements that were found in cognac sculpture, and cognac tradition, Things that related to them, but also to give a sense of a little bit of gender balance as well. Yeah. So, women's tattoo, pottery that's made by women, yeah. and and it, and it ended up being combined in a form that um, that Kuzatropa and the team that, that sort of came up with the idea thought would be a, an appropriate representation, appropriate you know, yeah. representation of, for themselves in in the museum. So, it really, is a a, a representation of of that. Group of people by the by the group of people them, themselves, basically. Uh, absolutely. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's, it really is an amazing piece of piece of work. And yeah. and, uh, and and so important for us actually because I think the way Kuzatropa described it. So there was a team of like four sculptures, four carvers that were working yeah. on it. Um, <clears throat> Kuzatropa actually donated the tree. The, the, uh, the, and he's, the, he's the guy who lived in the. Yes. So, yeah. He donated the tree for it. D donated the tree, supervised wow. the carving, and he said. This is going to be a house post for your museum. This will hold up your museum. Fantastic. It will also stand and support the heritage of the Cognac people yeah. that using your museum. So there's a sense of which we've had a lot of help with yeah. this exhibition, yeah, yeah. like any exhibition. Yeah. And it's, uh, yeah. Fascinating. Is, is that him in that photo the, over this, there? This is well? him, actually. This is a, uh, a, a portrait by... Um, uh, <coughs> by a Dutch photographer called uh, uh -huh. Peter Bos, who's working with, um, with a uh, 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 cognac, uh, Naga lady called Fajin Cognac, on a book which will hopefully be coming out later this year, uh, called uh, Last of the Tattooed Headhunters. And it's, it's a documentation ready for the first time of traditional Naga tattoos. And, um, and it's, it's hugely important. It's great to be able to be getting more indigenous voices. Yeah. Being able to talk about their own heritage, their yeah. own own history and culture, and that's in a sense one of the things we were trying to create a space for. Mm. But yes, this is because of Tropa, age ninety eight, a couple of years ago, so he's now now hundred years old, yeah. and is is an extraordinary, uh, extraordinary man. Extraordinary he looks guy. like an extremely impressive guy. He really he, does. He, he really um, 
Well, we're, we're, we're coming to the end of our, our mini tour, aren't we? And thank you so much for, uh, for showing us around. It really, really has been fascinating. Uh, remember, you need to come to, to this exhibition to see everything uh, properly. So, so make sure you do that. It's, it's here for almost the, the next year, well, for about a year, isn't yep. it? So, it closes on 22nd of April 2018, so get in quick. There's, yeah, we're going to quick. Uh, make sure you uh, come down. And this is also part of a wider project. Um, Absolutely, at the Cambridge yeah. University Museum, isn't it? Yeah. So, so throughout the throughout the summer and the rest of the year, we're at the University of Cambridge Museums oh. are are running a festival, a shared season called India Unbox, oh. which is you know literally and you know figuratively unboxing the yeah. the 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 the, the, um, the collections related to South Asia across mm -hmm. the across the university museums, but also you know um, dealing with the themes that connect. Cambridge and mm. India in many different ways, and there are so there are exhibitions, performances, talks, mm. uh, and other events um, throughout the year. So make sure that you check the Cambridge University Museum's website and their social media pages. Uh, follow Facebook, follow Twitter to find out all the details about that. Uh, and we're going to finish off by uh, looking at this quote here, yeah. aren't we? Yeah. Um, so tell tell us about this. Where does this come from? So this is. Uh, Ruby's going to hate me for doing this, but these are um, this is an extract from the the afterword to our uh, to the museum to the exhibitions catalogue by Ruby Hembron, uh, Santal artist, uh, Santal writer and publisher, uh, with whom we uh, this museum co-published the catalogue for the exhibition. So it's very important to us that it's available both in in India through the publishers Adivani and here in Cambridge. Um, and Ruby's forward talks about the importance of these objects and the importance of an exhibition like this to communities today. And so I think it's only fair that she has the last word, albeit voiced by me. <laughs> these objects speak of the bodies and the struggles they belong to. These objects assert the necessity to leave others behind. These objects form the links that connect us to our ancestors and to next generations. These objects amplify the voices of invisible peoples. These objects are the testimony of peoples refusing to be forgotten in every India. Wow, there we go. Um, Mark, thank you so much Pleasure. for uh, doing this. We really do um, appreciate it. Um, please do like and share this because we want as many people as possible to, to, to watch this video, uh, learn about this. Uh, and do come to Cambridge, come to the museum, see this exhibition because it, it, it really is, is fascinating. Um, but that's all for now um, and uh, we'll see you again soon. Thank you.